So I've got a whole group of change makers here, right? And um, these, are the, these are the individuals who, are, who form the backbone of the change that's being brought about from different stakeholder groups. Um, and as we all know, we've, we've heard all day the big theme for the Singapore FinTech Festival this year has been sustainability, right? And sustainability cuts across a whole bunch of areas. Uh, and we know that businesses now, given all that's going around, we know that businesses need to focus on areas that go beyond financial capital. We need to look at human capital. We need to look at natural capital. We need to look at social capital. How do we bring about that change? Here are the folks that are going to make that, uh, make that happen. So we've got a good mix of people from public policy and, 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 and government. We've got people from industry, specialists who are actually responsible for sustainability in their organizations. And we've got people uh, we've got stakeholders who represent the voice of the communities. Um, so I'm going to take a quick, uh, quick minute just to introduce everyone. On my right is um, Her Excellency Jo Tyndall. She is the High Commissioner for New Zealand uh, to Singapore. What a lot of people might not know is that Jo has spent uh, an entire decade being a climate change negotiator. So she has been um, making, bringing about change by being the UN ambassador uh, for New Zealand on climate change. She has been on the executive committee, the working committee of the UN, uh, focused on driving the negotiations for the Paris Accord. Um, and then she, has, she represents a nation that um, takes a very, very forward-looking stance on the issue of climate change. So it'd be great to get your perspective, Joe. We've got Sao Xiong. Um, Sao Xiong is the CEO of SP Digital. Um, number of global first initiatives, Singap great Singapore story, utilities company from Singapore that's actually taking um, initiatives based on digital transformation to bring about change that's more, that's going to drive much greater sustainability uh, from, um, by using energy tech. And I have to call out my, my favorite, them all. I've got Isabel, who's, um, who's flew in from Bali. Isabel is a founder um, a co-founder of Bye Bye Plastic Bags. If some of you are staying for dinner tonight, uh, Isabel will not be able to join us because she is the school night and she has to fly back. Um, Isabel is 17 um, and her sister is 19 now. Yeah, um, 18. So Isabel and Milati, uh, winners of um, the Young Heroes Award from CNN last year, started a movement about six years ago in Bali. Uh, that movement has now spread across 40 nations with 50 plus, uh, with a team of 50 plus uh, NGOs that are driving this movement around single, you know, ban on single-use plastics, saying no to plastic bags, uh, and just basically representing the voice of the youth. So we'd love to love to hear more. Um, Esteran, for most of you who are uh, Singaporean and I'm from Singapore and are really focused on the theme of sustainability, um, Esther does not require. Uh, much of an introduction. Um, you know, Esther represents a company that uh, launched the first green bond from Singapore, CDL, City Development Limited. And um, Esther has been doing, has been in this role as Chief Sustainability Officer for over two decades, way before it was cool to have that job title, right? So, so Esther, we'd love to hear more about the Singaporean story, but also what you've, what you've been seeing from a corporate governance standpoint. Uh, we've got Maya Hari, who runs Twitter across Asia Pacific. Maya has got, uh, it's great timing actually, because Ma Maya has a great pulse running Twitter. She understands the sentiment and around this movement of sustainability and climate change. How is the community's voice uh, changing? What's, um, you know, how is everyone, how are the business stakeholders responding to it globally? Um, ironically, Twitter released a report about three days ago and one of the biggest trends they focused on was this issue of sustainability and climate change. So we'd love to hear more about that. Uh, we've got Jason Wolf. Jason is um, the president for SAP Ariba for Asia Pacific in Japan. Um, being a corporate leader, understands technology really well, understands the role of technology specifically in driving uh, business communities and also in terms of uh, financial services. So, but a role outside of that that he, he's very passionate about is the fact that he drives the pillar in his organization focused on purpose-driven 
uh, pur pur purpose-driven culture. And I think, you know, we'd love to hear more about that. We've got Pamela Lee uh, from uh, the Prime Minister's office in Singapore. Pamela is, um, has, has been in various public policy roles throughout her career, but at the moment she's focused on driving the strategy for, um, on climate change for the Prime Minister's office um, in Singapore. And so we'd love to hear what Singapore is doing around that. We've got Bradley, um, Bradley Bacetto, who's the director of UNDP's um, Global Center for Innovation, Technology, and Sustainability. Um, Bradley is um, a pioneer in uh, driving sustainable finance and emergence of new business models focused on sustainability. So, so Bradley, we'd love to hear from you. And finally, we've got, we got, we got Shasha. Shasha is the Chief Sustainability Officer and the Global Head of Group Affairs, uh, uh, Global Head of um, uh, uh, Corporate Affairs for, for Air Asia Group. Um, you know, she has, um, so a couple of things I want to highlight about Shasha and Air Asia. First of all, most of you don't know, Air Asia does a lot more than aviation. Uh, Air Asia is a, you know, an, a travel lifestyle and fintech company. In fact, Air Asia have an organization called Big Pay, and their CEO is also speaking at this festival uh, on Wednesday. But what we are here to hear about from, from Shasha, who's also not um, new to fintech, she has been with Bank Nagara, which is um, the Reserve Bank of, uh, for those of you who might not be aware, is the Reserve Bank of Malaysia, uh, the Central Bank for Malaysia. And uh, Shasha has been in various roles. She is an economist by qualification and, and profession. And she has played various roles uh, across Bank Negara for nearly 13 years. Um, so with that, with the bank, we're going to, you know, I, I want to kick off. I'm going to take a seat now. And I'm going to pose my first question uh, to a couple of policymakers and government leaders. So first of all, on my right, um, so Joe, uh, Your Excellency, tell me this. You've been a climate change negotiator. Um, you've, you've obviously got a very strong view on New Zealand's stance on, um, on this issue of sustainability and climate change. And that, is, that does represent the Maori view of the world anyway. So if I could just ask you, just to kick it off, what do you think governments, businesses, and communities need to do to, to better align their objectives, because there are so many different conversations taking place. How do you, how do you get everyone to work towards collective action moving in the right direction? Well, um, thanks very much, Amit, and it's great to be here today. And I have to say, uh, as a public servant, I don't have strong views about anything. Right. Um, I'm here to serve the government of the day, but happily, uh, the government uh, in New Zealand uh, of the day uh, has made climate change one of its uh, top three priorities uh, and is definitely uh, trying to be a world leader. Um, just last week, passing into law um, a, uh, a piece of legislation that aims to, well, will ensure New Zealand uh, will be net zero uh, in terms of carbon uh, um, emissions by 2050. So we're, we're really thrilled that that um, has gone through. Now, we've known, and the scientists have been telling us for, for some decades, many decades, in fact, um, that climate change is a big problem and that we need to do something about it. Um, but uh, it has been very, very difficult to, to get some traction, and there's, I think, a number of reasons for that. Um, uh, partly, it's a problem because it's a, it's a global issue. Um, and, and no single country no single government can uh, um, take action to, to resolve the problem. It needs a, a global solution. It's a, uh, difficult because it's, it's about a, a global economic transformation. It's not just an environmental issue that's kind of off to one side. It is at the centre um, of uh, our economic future as, as a globe. It's, uh, I think, also difficult because the scale of the problem can seem so overwhelming. There's a bit of a tendency to just want to pull the covers up over your head and, and hope it'll perhaps uh, go away. So um, there have been, uh, I think, a lot of uh, um, reasons why it's been very, very difficult um, for uh, the, the world and for individual com governments to, to find a solution. Happily, I do think we are beginning to be at a turning point. Um, we 
have the rules, the international rules, through the Paris Agreement that was adopted um, in uh, 2015 and entered into force uh, barely a year um, after that. That uh, sets a really clear political signal um, by 196 governments who are members of the, the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. And it's a political signal for the long term, setting long term temperature goals that uh, um, gives a really important context. What that has meant is that governments have then turned around and started to think about their domestic policies, started to put policies in place like the zero carbon legislation um, in New Zealand, like emissions trading schemes um, and, and policies to, to uh, uh, transform the energy sector, tra uh, transport sector, et cetera, or the waste sector, et cetera, et cetera. I think you are starting to see um, a bit of a, uh, a, um, a virtuous circle forming because political signals also need to be supported by market signals, by business signals. Politicians want to know that uh, they are taking their constituencies with them. Um, and uh, we are starting to see from a, a variety of, of um, uh, perspectives, business thinking more in terms of sustainability, thinking more in terms of, of um, how they can support um, uh, the signals they're, they're hearing from governments. Sometimes it's out of self-interest, not wanting to have stranded assets, for example. Sometimes it is because of increasing pressure from shareholders, um, which is really, I think, I think changing. <coughs> and the last component, uh, which has grown phenomenally in the last year, is um, activism and a very strong sense that young people today um, and this has you know, been the climate strikes led by Greta Thunberg from Sweden, for example, that young people today care very deeply about um, inheriting a habitable planet. So um, I suppose uh, uh, for me, it's the, the, the critical things are to be thinking about alignment, uh, policy alignment um, and kind of mainstreaming or normalizing climate change um, into uh, policy making and decision making, uh, both in terms of government, which is one thing we are doing in New Zealand, um, and also um, in terms of uh, the, the private sector, business sector. Um, and and I, I think uh, there is a growing understanding in the business world um, that uh, this needs to, to happen as well. Uh, in New Zealand, there is a, a so-called Climate Leaders Coalition that only started just over a year ago with 13 quite big companies in it. It now has 122 companies within that coalition committed to achieving the, the Paris Agreement temperature goals, um, setting their own targets, uh, and uh, those companies account for more than 60% of total emissions uh, in New Zealand. Um, so I, I, I do think the other thing is it's critical to think about the long term, to plan for the long term and not uh, be too distracted by short term pressures where whether you're a government or a company um, or whoever you are, you need to um, be mindful of costs. So if there are short term costs, it's really, really difficult to take decisions that are going to impose those costs, even though you know that the long-term benefits are, are, um, are good. So the final point, I guess, is you mentioned the Māori view of the world. Um, and, and I think the Māori view of the world is very much in sync with, in line with sustainability. Um, it is about uh, thinking uh, in intergenerational terms. It's about seeing yourself uh, as uh, guardians of the land uh, and of, uh, of the people. And that, to me, is, is the, the very basis of sustainability. Um, it is not just thinking about uh, prosperity in terms of wealth, but also um, in terms of well-being. Um, it is uh, about um, uh, putting people and planet first. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. And, and look, there's, there's a few points there um, 
Your Excellency, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick those up during, during the session. Uh, the first one I want to pick up is, you know, individual countries can't make a difference. It has to be collective goal, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. And you've got, so when you start to think about the whole ability to implement uh, or institutionalize climate change as part of the strategic future's vision for nations, right? Question for you, Bradley, I mean, because you work across a whole bunch of governments, and I'll probably later on want to touch on this with you as well, Pamela, because I, I know Singapore has, um, has made a lot of progress and, and leads in a number of uh, areas, but Bradley, what's your view on this? Well, um, I think Joe, Joe has really sort of articulated very, very well the sort of broader context um, of, 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 I guess, the challenge, but also some of the opportunities as well. Um, globally. Um, but look, um, countries and governments have blueprints to, to, to make progress on this, right? I mean, every country in the world, bar one or two at this point, have signed up to the Paris um, Agreement, right? So they've all got detailed plans on, on how, to, how to really move um, uh, in, on climate change. Um, but as Joe pointed out, too, it, it's the devils in the details and how you how you sort of, how you, how you actually implement those plans now, and how you galvanize corporates, how you galvanize uh, activists and citizens and communities um, to, to get it done. But, but the plans and the commitments are, are there, right? And so I was just in, um, I just literally returned this morning from West Africa, um, meeting um, a group of, um, well, UN leaders, um, and also meeting with the, the head of the, the UN development program. And, What's clear is that uh, probably, at least for the UN Development Program, it, it, our number one most critical role is to, uh, globally I mean, is to help countries along this path and nudge them and push them and help capacitate them to, to actually implement these plans that they've actually committed to, right? We can't do that alone, not at all, but, but that's sort of the existential do or die thing for a big chunk of, of, of the UN, to be honest. Um, and in these African, UN representatives and, and, and government officials from all the various countries, they're feeling climate change maybe um, the most and already. I mean, virtually every country is on the front line of climate change now, right? I mean, everyone is, but Singapore very much included. But, but Africa is being devastated in certain parts of it because of climate change. Uh, you know, it's a causal factor in conflict and in migration. Um, and so, what we're trying to do here with this new Center for Tech and Innovation and Sustainability is, is think of ways in which we can leverage the, not just Singapore's experience, but, but um, throughout the world, technologies that can help countries everywhere um, do better at, at fighting climate change and, and adapting to it and, and, and just, um, and but one thing I'm thinking, one area I'm thinking about is for example, um, Singapore's experience, um, smart city, smart nation, right? Um, how it's using technology to, to reduce emissions, to manage its energy, um, and so many other things, right? And so many of the, the leaders in Africa, in the UN that I talked to, were super excited about the potential of leveraging this sort of thing and developing the first smart cities in Africa, right? That would be one way to um, you know, start tackling um, um, climate change. Um, Another is um, and a very specific thing that we're launching, um, well, tomorrow, in fact, at, at Switch, is, is a, a global initiative on sustainable agriculture. Sustainable agriculture is crucial for the whole world, but especially, again, for Africa, and there was lots of excitement around this. So, in other words, how do you use um, digital technologies, um, new, new technologies to, to, to make uh, agriculture more sustainable, um, cheaper, um, more efficient inputs, um, and, and so forth. Um, as you know, Singapore is making this big push now into the future of food. And so again, we're leveraging the Singapore ecosystem to, to build this. But these are a couple of um, thoughts from, from, from me, I guess, initially. No, oh, that's great. And, and do, you, do, you, do you feel that, um, so if you look at what's happening in Singapore, and perhaps we'll get Pamela to chime in on that, but do you feel nations like Singapore, New Zealand, and, and I mean, there, there are other nations that are taking uh, making this an issue that's on the forefront, and, and 
Um, so how, how can those nations help address some of those issues? And, and maybe, uh, Pamela, if you can share first uh, what you're seeing uh, taking place from a, from a Singapore standpoint, because you know, Singapore is a great example of this urban nation, but that still um, it leads in a number of initiatives around being a very sustainable city. So how do you, how do you make that happen? Oh, thank you, Amit. Um, for Singapore, um, I think suffice to say climate change is an existential issue because we are a low-lying uh, low lying city-state and we've got to fit everything that we need, whether it's power generation, whether it's our ports, um, industry, into this tiny island and 30% of this tiny island is, is below 5 metres above sea level and so with the impact of uh, climate change, for example, on rising sea levels, uh, that would really, um, if, if we do not manage to adapt to this, these impacts, it would really be a, a, an existential issue of whether Singapore can continue to exist and the way of life as we know it, whether it can continue to exist. Um, and so we have put in place various measures. Um, I think our Prime Minister Lee talked about the adaptation measures that we will need to put in place extensively during um, his National Day rally speech earlier this year in August. But apart from protecting our coastal, uh, our, our coasts, um, we also are looking at other things. So for example, water security, we are a very water stressed um, country and climate change would exacerbate that. Um, and so we have over the years put in place uh, many measures. I would say that we now have four taps to uh, ensure our water security so we get our water both from our water catchment and we devote a significant proportion of Singapore's land to collecting water in our reservoirs for, for clean portable water. Um, we have, we buy water as well from Johor, Malaysia. Um, we've started to desalinate water um, and we also produce new water. And that's just an example of how we have overcome our constraints um, in order to uh, achieve water security, which is going to become an increasingly problematic area um, as climate change happens. Bradley talked about how um, we've set ourselves this challenge of producing 30% of our nutritional needs locally uh, by 2030. And this is, this is because even though Singapore does not face the problem of food security currently, because we, we import our food from so many countries around the world, it's going to become increasingly a problem and global supply chains can also be affected as well as countries which traditionally grow the food from which we get our food sources. Um, but we, we see this not just as an adaptation issue because even as we try and grow our nascent um, agriculture food uh, uh, sector in Singapore, we hope to be able to do so by um, employing uh, technologies and we also hope to do so uh, by being as circular, as resource efficient as possible. And if we succeed, these solutions can actually be exported to the region as well. And we also get to do our part, our small part, in being able to cut the transport emissions that are required to ship food from various places, far-flung places in the world to Singapore, because now it can get grown locally. What we're doing with regard to mitigation um, we've pledged under the Paris Agreement uh, to reduce our emissions intensity by 36% uh, from 2005 levels with the aim of peaking uh, around 2030. And we are currently in the process of developing our long-term low emission strategy. So uh, uh, Her Excellency Jo just talked about New Zealand's uh, 2050 strategy. And Singapore is developing our own. Um, obviously, Singapore has different national circumstances and constraints. We just announced how we are intending to increase um, the deployment of solar in Singapore, the only renewable energy source which really works because we don't have geothermal, we don't have hydro, the wind speed is too low in Singapore. So solar is our best bet. Um, and we said that we would be on track to being able to deploy 350 megawatt peak by 2020. And we're intending to almost uh, <coughs> go up tenfold to at least two gigawatt peak by 2030. But to put that in context, that would only account for 4% of our electricity generation, given today's electricity demand. So even when we go guns blazing and we try our best to increase solar deployment, that's only going to account for 4% of uh, our total electricity demand today. Um, which is why we're going to have to look at other sorts of technologies um, that would allow Singapore to hopefully be able to decarbonize and transit to a low carbon future in the, uh, in, in the mid 
in the middle of the century, and that would include things like looking at importation of perhaps green hydrogen, looking at um, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So I think I'll just stop there uh, in outlining what Singapore has done and we are looking into. Well, I think Pamela, that was, that was, uh, that was excellent. I, uh, what it has done is given me lots and lots of questions and I'm, I'm just collating those in my head. I just wanted to highlight to the audience that there is an option to go and pigeonhole the app um, and, and put your questions out there and those questions will be put forward to um, uh, this distinguished group of change makers. Um, I, I was going to take a different approach, uh, but I'll have to change it just based on what you ended on, Pamela. Uh, you talked about energy sources and, and um, you shared some of those stats and I'm just compelled to pose a question uh, and give the opportunity to, to Sao Xiong, who's, I was going to come to you a bit later, Sao Xiong, but uh, you're, the, you're the CEO of uh, SP Digital, and you know, your focus is on using energy tech and digital transformation to bring more efficiency in that energy sector uh, for SP Group. So, you know, perhaps you have some viewpoints to share with what Pamela just talked about. So, um, just to give some, some context, uh, SP Digital is a part of SP Group. SP Group is the main utility in Singapore. So, Singapore Power is what some of the, uh, I would say, the earlier generations will be more familiar with. So, we are the main utility and uh, uh, we deliver electricity from the uh, generation to down to the uh, our customers, right? And SP Digital was an effort that was started up about three and a half years ago. Um, our main focus was really to do digital transformation then, and uh, we started off uh, really small. I think the uh, the idea was really how can we improve the, e the efficiency of the organization? How can we help the organization to look at other things that? Uh, are in the energy industry uh, beyond just doing transmission and, di and distribution as well as uh, metering. And we have done a lot. So over the, the three years, uh, past over the three years in, since 2016, we have uh, done a lot of things, uh, too ma many to enumerate here. But about earlier part of this year, we decided to, to go out and help other organizations as well. Um, but one thing that I, I do want to bring up that uh, we actually did uh, pretty well uh, in uh, 2016, 20, end of 2016, early 2017, we started building this app called the SP Utilities app, uh, which I think uh, a number of our, our consumers use today. And interestingly, a number of the SMEs use too, right? So the SP Utilities app, we started off as a purely transactional application. So uh, before that, we, we had just purely content, right? So you just see a bill every month and then you, you take the same bill and you go and, and pay at the uh, nearest post office and so on. We extended that to be transactional and over time we built a lot of capabilities on top of it. So today, for example, uh, if you have a smart meter at home, you can actually view your uh, electricity consumption every half hour. So uh, there's a bit of a delay because it takes some time for the information to be transferred for anywhere around the island. So we have island-wide coverage. So uh, the smart meter actually transmit the, the data of your consumption to us where we display it to you uh, so you can really know how much you have been using. That drives behavior change, right? Because if you look at it from today's perspective, the meter readers go to your home once every two months and we estimate the middle month, right? And uh, this gives you information of how much you have used uh, as an estimation and so how, how does that change your behavior? You change your behavior once every two months, literally, right? But now I give you the information once every half hour. You can actually know how much you have used. In fact, we have driven this a little bit further on. About uh, two, three weeks ago, we started off this campaign called the Green Up campaign, where we try to gamify this information by giving you more, giving you some awards, right? Singaporean loves awards, right? So freebies and, and everything. So we, we try to gamify it and try to help uh, people to change the mindset in the <coughs> usage uh, to drive the, the message of sustainability. So I think the, the message here then is on how can we as individuals uh, do better for the, uh, for the environment, for, for sustainability. So that's, that's one aspect of what we're trying to do. So uh, in terms of the efforts for Singap Singapore Power and, and SP Digital per se, so I think for the consumer that's the most obvious that you can see. Uh, the SP Utilities app. So if you drive an EV here, anyone uh, in the audience here drive an EV today, Singapore Power owns the largest fleet of uh, public charging stations, charging uh, stations where we have about 250 today 
uh, in Singapore. We aim to have about 1,000 by end of uh, 2020. And using the SP Utilities app, you can locate the uh, charging station. You can charge. You can actually control the charging station through the app. And you can pay for it as well. And uh, all of these things are, are available through the app itself. Uh, super convenient. Uh, and a majority of our uh, EV drivers actually use it today. So those are some of the things that we are doing here with uh, uh, SP Digital. Fantastic. Um, can I just steer the conversation back to, um, um, I guess, to businesses and, and the role of um, corporates, since most, most of the crowd here uh, represents the business community. Can I, um, so perhaps Esther, you've been, you've been playing uh, a big role in this for, for many years. You've seen, um, you've seen a lot of, um, a lot of developments. You've seen lots of pushbacks. You've seen, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, in, a in a very wise person's words, I won't quote them, we have to have a very pragmatic, hard-nosed view on this subject rather than just a moralistic or idealistic view. And so, you know, for businesses, it's all about uh, the bottom line, right? You, you have responsibilities to shareholders, to employees, to customers. Um, so what can businesses do, uh, Esther, in your viewpoint, um, that would allow uh, putting the planet and people first, but still be able to wor work towards economic success? Okay, uh, yeah, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, well, we are from the building sector, as you know, our core business is to build home and uh, commercial properties and also a landlord. And uh, we know that cities actually account for 70% of greenhouse gas emissions and building alone account for 40% of greenhouse gas emission. So energy efficiency, clean energy, low carbons are really uh, uh, it's the global agenda. And in the building sector, we feel that we have high impact on the environment. That also enables us to make a difference, not just within our own organization, but actually engaging the whole value chain, whether it is from the regulators, the investors, financial banks, insurers, and suppliers, and down the line to consumer home, home users and all that. And uh, of course, we have quite a lot of a few partners on this panel already is that we actually adopt the low carbons together and uh, research show that uh, we spend 90% of our time indoors 69% at home, and then the rest is like at work and uh, even like, you know, conferences and uh, cinema, F&B outlets and all that. How we design a building, <coughs> how we build, how we manage, and uh, do make a difference. And as users, everybody can make a difference too, because you spend a lot of time at home. And uh, definitely, uh, low carbon nowadays is a keyword. Circular economy is the keyword. We actually um, uh, account uh, for every building, the OPEX actually, uh, energy account for about 50% of the operating cost. So how do we manage and reduce cost, uh, reduce energy has a very big impact on the environment and also on the bottom line. As a list of company, we also want to impress on the ESG investors, which is growing tremendously. And they really look at the company's performance, whether you're in, in, how you score in the environment, social and governance, before they make a decision of parking you know, millions of dollars in you and, and all that. So of course, when we first started in 1995, you know, to, um, the ethos is to conserve as we construct. That, started with like the right things to do. We want to transform our business. We want to align ourselves with global best practices and uh, putting planet and people first before prof profits. But being a private organization, we still have to maintain profitable. If you can't maintain profitable, the first one to suffer is your employees. They will lose their job. And uh, so that's why we have to strike that balance. And uh, how you maintain profitable, with not at the expense of the climate, not at the expense of the people, that has been always our, our fundamental. And of course, building will not suddenly go zero energy or low carbon, you know, if you don't rely on technology and innovation. To tell the truth, we actually set a target that it is really, really very challenging for ourselves, uh, is to reduce, 59, uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emission by 59% uh, by 2030. And with today's technology and solutions and practices, we will not be able to achieve it. <coughs> so that 
target also help to drive us to look for, to scout for technology, scout for partnership and all that. And of course, clean energy, solar is like Pamela say, is our biggest bet. And uh, how do we look at solar panels, that how do we improve the performance of it? And uh, we all think that Singapore have a lot of sun, you thought the yield is very good. Actually, it is not quite. And we also have very limited space, and uh, just to find space to build solar panels and, and all that, already a big challenge. So we are already looking at tomorrow's technology, R&D, you know, to look at building, you know, integrated, you know, vertical type of solar panels and how do we improve the performance. All these don't come cheap. So that is where the finance part come into the picture. And we actually uh, was uh, very happy that we actually tap onto the capital market. We launched the first green bond in 2017 April, connecting how we maintain building our Republic Plaza at the highest level of Green Mark Platinum level uh, with, you know, using technology, using, you know, innovation. And we tap onto an alternative financing, you know. And uh, earlier this year, we also launched a, a green loan, 500 mil, to really invest in green features and design for our new development. And uh, of course, I am, uh, have always been an advocate for SDG, the sing uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Leaving no one behind is the ideal, but how to leave no one behind? I always joke that this is actually like a Robin Hood, you know, and you tap onto the countries, the investors who have a lot of money and resources, and help them to invest in countries that have not, or, you know, that is suffering from like, you know, poor uh, access to uh, mobility, energies, and all that. So how do we shift the capital from the have to the have not? That is where SDG come into the picture, and uh, that's why we also launched our SDG innovation loan, making use of innovation, how do we achieve, you know, SDG, whether it is climate action, whether it is raising energy efficiency, you know, clean energy, and uh, even uh, marine conservation. So this is something that it is very exciting, very innovative, not just about infrastructure design innovation, but also how to tap onto the finance, you know, market and the capital market and uh, attract attracting investors mm -hmm. to come to support uh, innovation, that is something that it is with really, really big potential. And of course, SP is also, you know, we, we partner them and we are one of your, your first users, actually, of the uh, blockchain uh, marketplace, right, uh, for, for REC trading. And uh, of course, UNDP, we also work with UNDP to just establish, a, started an a incubator for SDG. Actually, is to provide rent-free space for innovator, young innovator from one to three years old. We we want to help them to upscale within this one year. Uh, we want to provide resources, mentorship to help them grow. And we are really looking at some very good potentials to whether it is sustainable materials or solar energy. And uh, we hope that after one year, we will be able to, you know, dish out a very good report card. And uh, I think I better stop. Otherwise, 25 years of history will take five hours. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, well, well, thank you for sharing that. I. There were a lot of things that I picked on there, Esther, um, and you know I know you've got a wealth of experience in uh, in sharing your um, uh, and providing a lot of value to this discussion. Uh, I will come back to some points. What I did pick on was you said um, how to leave no one behind. You know what that that brings me to Shasha because you're you know you represent an organisation that's gone from being travel to travel, lifestyle, uh, fintech. And, and many more things, and uh, I know you're also making big strides in digital as an organization, but you know, your tagline has gone from everyone can fly, so that's uh, inclusive, but it's changed to everyone can fly responsibly. And I think one of the things I wanted to ask was, um, <coughs> as a lead into, as we get into our voice of the communities and, and the youth, you know, what, how do we make our organizations more attractive one, for millennials to, to attract that sort of talent. But more importantly, <coughs> we know that we need to have purpose-driven cultures in the organizations to bring about this change. Um, are you able to share with us some of your viewpoints and your experiences around that? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm not sure, has anyone flown on an AirAsia plane? Thank you so much. Thank you for helping us be business sustainable. But um, what I'd like to highlight and to answer to your point is 
Uh, when it comes to Air Asia, yes, inclusivity has always been at the core. Now everyone can fly was really something that our co-founder, Tony Fernandez, thought of in the shower because he looked, when we started in Malaysia 18 years ago, um, only 6% of Malaysians flew because air travel was a luxury. Only the rich can travel for tourism, for trade, to meet a loved one, for education, in fact. But now, after 18 years, so from two planes to about 300 planes, uh, we've grown to become the number 13 largest airline in the world, was really by making sure that air travel is affordable. So we disrupted the air travel. But looking back and how we're, we've embarked on this sustainable journey is really focusing on within. So a lot of organizations like to say, like, okay, how can we uh, be recognized as a sustainable organization? But for us, we said there's three objectives to our sustainability journey. First is, how do we um, clean up our own house? So that when people, when passengers, uh, when our business partners look at us and we say that, uh, they look at AirAsia and say, that, ah, they're doing all these sustainable steps. So in embedding that culture within um, AirAsia, we've embedded um, sustainability as a KPI. So it's no longer how much money or how much revenue brought in for the company, but how did you embed sustainability practices, whether you're a pilot, piloting our planes and making sure that you've, uh, bec uh, you've used the best fuel um, uh, saving <coughs> initiatives, or whether it's even our board members who guide our governance process. And to share like a story, uh, when, when I went to the board to present some of sustainability objectives, even our board members are saying, ah, Shasha, why are you talking about governance and um, social? Isn't sustainability about going green? And so, you know, those are some of the fundamental questions that we try to educate ourselves where sustainability is not just about going green, but it's how, how do we serve our communities better? And uh, how do we make sure that we also promote uh, uh, more inclusivity and equality in our business uh, practices? So that's the first, uh, building, uh, making sure our house is in order. Second is uh, preventing or cleaning up the mess that we have created. Um, and you know, our tagline is now everyone can fly. So 50% of my time, I do government relations. I meet govern governments and says how good aviation is. It's 10% of GDP. It brings tourism and trade to your economy, but then the other 50% of my time, I will also tell them now everyone can fly, now human traffickers can fly with Air Asia. Now wildlife traffickers can fly. So what are we doing about that? Hence, for uh, um, human uh, trafficking, we make sure that our cabin crew, our ground staff, those first, uh, uh, first liners when they meet our passengers, uh, know how to spot a human trafficker and know how to then report it. Uh, similarly for wildlife trafficking, a lot of wildlife traffickers in our part of the world um, travel on Air Asia to go to one country or another um, to uh, go and poach or do illegal trading. So this is where even tomorrow, so we'll be launching our, we're saving the Malayan tiger, one of the nine species in the world that is close to extinction, where we're painting a, a plane so that we can show how, how, how much awareness and making sure that the in-flight announcement is also something that we embed some of the sustainability practices. Um, and then thirdly is, uh, when it comes to sustainable practices, is then, then only looking outward and saying, ah, there's 20, 30 trillion US dollar of funds of ESG, of economic, social governance, of people who want to invest in companies. And um, that's why we've aligned all our practices from the KPIs to training internally to making sure that even our suppliers that we deal with are ethical and responsible suppliers. And I'm happy to say that this year, for the first time ever, we uh, submitted ourselves into the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And we're the only ASEAN and low-cost airline to be recognized as top 10 in the sustainable aviation category. Oh, great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, slight different, different tack. I, uh, you know, we've talked about, we've talked about uh, the policymakers and the government and, and the priorities. We've talked about uh, various facets of, of business. Um, we, we talked about purpose-driven uh, culture. Uh, I want to shift it um, a little bit, uh, Jason, to you. Uh, from a from a technology standpoint, you know what what 
you know, you, you're, you're running uh, a SAP's Ariba business across Asia Pacific, working very closely with the business community. And what does purpose-driven culture mean for you guys as an organization internally? Well, thank you, Amit. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be on this panel. You know, I think purpose-driven is something that is, it, it's starting to touch on the, the heart of what we want to see organizations do. And I, and I think I've heard a lot of great comments on the panel today around we need to have a point of view. No one country can do this. It takes some level of adaptation, but how do you actually start to unlock um, a new approach or a new beginning? So what we've done is, is we, we've essentially ushered in a concept known as business with purpose. And what we've we found is that um, we started with a very simple principle. We asked our employees uh, to kind of adhere to one concept. We want their work life to be something they can be proud of in their home life. So that was the starting point. The second thing we did is we asked them to give a pledge around sustainability, around purpose, around something that they can do as an individual. And what we found was the day we asked the pledge, there was something like 250 pledges sent in to the organization. And what we found was ultimately the concept of a legislative change or an organizational change or a technology change, all that's important. But if you can dig into the root of what a person wants to do, and if you can give them the opportunity or you can empower them to, to voice their approach, great things will happen. Here's a very simple example. It was with a paint company called Dulux Paints out of Australia. And in our business, we do a lot of focus with our customers around understanding their spend, understanding their suppliers, identifying what types of suppliers they have, but also building compliance and controls and very mundane business practices. What was so beautiful about this example at Dulux Paints is that the supply chain officer said, we're building a couple new factories. I have one ambition. I don't want to print paper. So how do you, as a technology, help me not print paper. And it ended up being that his personal ambition tied into the company's ambition and tied into our ambition to help them do something great. And I think, I think when we look at businesses, and if we expect a, just a superior wave of change to happen, it's going to be hard. But if we actually look at the individuals inside your business and you ask them what their purpose is, we've got 250 examples where we're, we're actually seeing that concept thrive. And I think it's something that's, that starts to move us from adaptation, that starts to move us from the concept of no country can do it perfectly, but into an organizational push or even pull to say, you know what? The people that work for us care deeply about this. The people that work at the company that we're working with probably care deeply about this. Tap into that, bring it together, and build a, a beautiful foundation based on purpose. And I think it's fabulous. We actually have 25 customer examples similar to the Dulux paint story, and they keep growing because, frankly, we ask the question, what's your business purpose? And for many organizations, they don't know, and for others, they're trying to find out. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jason. So, Isabel, you can see that we are, we are working towards it as a community. But um, I'm going to come to Isabel. I want to leave you for the last for a reason. But, Maya, I, want, I wanted to go through this round and... And, and come back to you just to help us understand, you know, you have the pulse of the market. You see that. You see the trends. So share with us, I mean, what are you seeing as some of the biggest trends and successes um, in this climate change movement uh, from around the world? And, and you know, what, what, what do you think is working, what's not? Thank you, Amit. It's great to be here and, um, and share a little bit of the Twitter story. We sort of sit at the platform side of this. Um, and if you think about the fact that Majority of tweets are public. It's a very quick dipstick. It's the world's largest focus group to know exactly real time what is the world thinking about, right? So if you think about climate change and sustainability, over the years, there's been a certain level of conversation that has always happened about this topic, and it's grown gradually. But we saw a pretty big tidal shift in that growth trajectory last year. And that's when we started thinking, we started noticing the fact that, you know, people around the world are really waking up to the reality of 
what's what's going on around us as far as the planet and uh, climate was going on. And this year has been an even bigger year. We've seen 170 million tweets go out in the world around this topic just in the first nine months of the, of the year, and it's doubled over last year. Now, why do we care about these numbers? It just shows the trajectory of how much attention is coming to this topic, right? What, one of the things that's interesting is that people, through their tweets, are observing less and actually being more action-oriented now, which is very heartening, personally, to see that people actually want to do something about it. And when we looked at these tweets, we sort of found that developing countries, as well as developed countries, were both had fairly good representation there. Again, you know, we, we want to see this. We want to see both sides of the, uh, of the world um, represented there. So you take a Germany or a Sweden, very much up there among the top countries that are engaging in this conversation. But at the same time, you take a Thailand or a Fiji, they're also among the top countries that are, that are tweeting. So there's an interesting global movement here. It's not one country driven, uh, and, it, and it's really great to see. I think some of the, uh, you, know, you mentioned the trend report that we did. There's, uh, there was about six mega trends or 18 trends in total that we noticed from tweets that were developing uh, in sentiment. And one mega trend was around the planet, right? And, and I want to just walk through the three trends within that mega trend that we saw. The first and foremost was really consumers becoming very conscious about an ethical self. Right? And this comes back, and I'm going to tie back to why, why the economic side of this equation has to tie well to the consumer uh, passion side of the equation. And so the, the ethical self, really, what we found is that consumers, particularly around their food consumption and their lifestyle, but food to a large extent, have brought a lot of focus to themselves and brought a conscious effort to change how they eat, what they consume. So veganism, no surprise there, has a very strong tie to that. Um, the second piece that we, th that we sort of found was that this very pragmatic approach that consumers are taking to building sustainability in their lives. So very specific steps. I want to get rid of straws. I want to get rid of plastic bags. I want to uh, travel differently or I want to compensate for my travel when I can. Um, so that I'm conscious about my footprint. So this level of pragmatism in tackling the topic has never been seen before, right? And the, the amount of tweets we see is sort of very interesting. The, the, the last trend that I want to share was, was, was very cool. This was um, about clean corporations. And uh, very clearly, as this, as this uh, panel has shown, there's the government side of it, there's the expectation of the corporates and the consumers. Um, but increasingly, we see corporates putting their money where their waste is, right? And this is, a, th this is the consciousness that's coming about. It's a start, um, but, it's an, but it's an important start. So you start to see thinking about food wastage, of e-wastage, uh, things like that being top of mind. So, you know, I, I'd say it's a heartening trend that we see. A lot of work to be done still, but from everything we see as Twitter on the platform, um, the power of an individual starting to drive community-based activism around this has been interesting. Uh, much like Isabel, there's another young lady in, in another part of the world, Greta Thunberg. Joe, you talked about her. She was responsible for a, a large part of this conversation that started last year around climate change. She was a teenager. She is a teenager. And... Um, and one out of 10 tweets on climate, climate change really were attributable to, uh, to her in large part. So it's amazing the power of uh, movements that can be created by an individual. Yeah, and look, <coughs> I think that's a um, perfect segue for me to hand this over to Isabel. So Isabel, we know that there's, uh, there is the power in this collective movement uh, of the youth, right? Um, You've heard a whole bunch of different stakeholders that, can, that have the ability and are trying hard to bring about change. I think what I'd really like to put to you is, and this becomes a pivotal part of our roundtable, so no pressure. Um, you've, been, you've been doing this for six years now. You've been driving this movement for six years, you and your sister. Um, you've obviously garnered a lot of support globally. I think before I get into understanding your journey, um, if you can 
so much as not just speak to us as roundtable, but to the audience. I want to understand what is the voice of the youth? You know, what are the expectations that people like yourselves, who are so committed to this cause for six years, you've been working on it, you know, when other, other kids were out there playing outside and you were trying to figure out how to not get plastic bags being thrown around. Um, you know, what are your drivers? What are your expectations? When you speak to your peers, what do you expect from this group of stakeholders and from the audience? Ah, I think, you know, to start off, I want to say I think the youth can come up with a pretty long wish list that would take me until the rest of today to read out loud. But I think to sort of nail it down, and I want to say congratulations to all the people up here on the stage. I think all of you guys are doing an amazing, you know, first steps on your journeys to making your corporations and industries out there more sustainable in so many different aspects. But I also do want to highlight that there are a lot of corporations, industries, businesses out there that are not doing enough, right? Um, and I think for the youth, one of the biggest things is, um, especially in the line of work that we've done and a lot of government lobbying, is that we love seeing action plans and reports being put out. We love reading them, we love learning, we love getting knowledge passed down to us. We're hungry for information, right? But after that point, it, we need to see the regulation and the implementation of those policies actually following out, right? It's very easy to say, okay, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, but the actual implementation follow through hands-on work that needs to be taken place, and of course, it's, it's hard, right? As um, the first two speakers mentioned as well, you know, of course you want to move forward. Of course you want to make these policies realistic in your countries, in your businesses, but how it actually falls into play and into a reality is sometimes hard. But as a young person, and I think I can speak for a lot of our generation, we're optimistic, right? We don't see all the little small challenges. We see the solution there, and we just want to dive into it. We want to jump into it and just go for it, right? And I think that's... The speciality of some young people is the ability to think outside the box. And I think because of that role and because that mindset that we have, we can play the role of connecting the dots, right? We have the capital. We have the ideas. We have the scientists. We have the businesses. We have the willingness to all move into a more sustainable future. It's now just a matter of connecting the dots and collaborating, right? Because in all of the change that we've seen in the past, we have seen many different stakeholders rise up and move and speak out and you know say their part. But in history, the most successful movements have been when there is collaboration, when people work together. Because us with Bye Bye Plastic Bags, we wouldn't be where we are today without our team. I'm sure everyone on this panel, everyone in this room is part of a team or has a team backing them up. And so I think moving forward, if we want to create real change, it's through collaboration for sure. And so I want to see, you know, all of these stakeholders sort of putting aside their differences because it is hard sometimes. You know, if you look already only back five years ago, it was the activists pointing to, you know, the government governors um, saying, you're not doing enough, da, da, da. the businesses yelling at the scientists, you're putting out the wrong numbers, yada, yada, yada. And it's time to see the shift, right, of, okay, you know, pointing fingers and blaming each other, being angry at each other isn't going to get us anywhere, right? We all have our role, our uniqueness to bring to the table, and it's time to foster that and facilitate it in a way that we can really move forward. So yeah, wow. I hope that answered it a little bit. <laughs> and you are 17? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think you've given us a lot to think about. Who wants to take a shot at addressing Isabel's concerns first? I mean, I'm... <laughs> can I add more fuel to the fire? Sure. I think the, the question always comes between, do you have to make a choice between doing good and being responsible and making money? And that, given, given this is a, a, a business crowd, some of the things that are, are very interesting is that people like Isabel, um, when, we, when we looked at research data, show that six out of 10 people on Twitter uh, will actually pay more for sustainable products. And one out of two people actually care deeply about the environment. And so if these are our future customers for any of our businesses, we would, I, I don't think we have a choice. I think our, our responsible decision is to be able to try and unite purpose and profit uh, in a way that our customers will, our future customers will accept. 
I mean, I think that was really beautifully said, if I can just jump in here really quickly, and I definitely think so. I know from my generation, when I'm buying gifts for you know my friends' birthdays and things, I always look for the gifts that are nice, that they will get use out of, but that also either give back to the community, give back to the environment in some other way, because a normal product isn't enough anymore. If you want to survive in the world that we're moving into, you have to go above and beyond. I just wanted to add two points. And uh, um, as I said right at the beginning, I, I think we are at a, at a turning point, and uh, it's in a positive direction. But this is a, a juggernaut um, on a global scale, and turning it round um, is, is not easy. Um, and, but I think what, what I do think is once a bit of momentum starts to happen, it can really build. Um, and you are seeing the push coming from a, a, a number of different direction, directions. I wanted to say just a couple of things. So first of all, from a government point of view, um, it's, it's not that much different from business. There's been this feeling that taking action on climate change is, is gonna be all cost, all obligation, bad, bad things. But increasingly, the evidence is coming through that it's not a binary choice. It's not either or. You can have economic prosperity. You can have well-being within your, your country. Um, and you can do that equally on a business level without meaning that you are going to lose money or, or um, uh, impose impossible costs. So that was one thing. I think the other thing that's really important to, to be thinking about, because you're quite right, the finger pointing, the, you know, you must do something, it's all your fault sort of thing, doesn't actually get you anywhere. But the other thing you, you uh, um, have to work with is understand that taking action can also bring co-benefits elsewhere. Um, and if one of the co-benefits, for example, um, is cleaning up your air, um, and um, ensuring that your citizens can breathe and are not going to, to um, get ill, it's, it's really important to sort of understand um, that there are a bunch of different drivers uh, that can um, help to get the outcome we want, even if they're not uh, the initial motivation necessarily. Yeah, and if I can jump onto that as well, or does anybody else want to speak? Um, definitely, I agree 100% with your second point in the, in the sense that, you know, we started with plastic bags. On our journey, you know, we went into waste management, into the entire plastics issue, and it is a complex and huge issue, and sometimes when looking at it, it's overwhelming. But I think because it's such a complex issue, there's not one solution to it, ever. Right? You can't solve the entire plastics issue by just saying no to plastic bags, and we definitely understand that. And so with such a complex issue, there has to be so many different solutions from so many different levels from all the different stakeholders, well, it, whether it's a grounds-up movement from the people or a top-down law policy or a change at the production point. All of these things will add up to the big solution that's going to solve the issue. If I may jump in, I really welcome this thought. You know, actually, we always joke that we've been building green home for the last 15 years. And when you need consumer to make a million dollar decision, are they going to choose a property that has more green feature or they're getting a property because it fits all the other deciding factor, which is location, design, budget, and all that. And I always say that I'm waiting for the millennials to grow up to buy our property. And uh, for the last 15 years, we have not been able to build a premium into very high level of green features, you know, and uh, green buildings and all that. But we can see the, the you know, the trend is really changing. And uh, we do a uh, survey <coughs> ev for every development we sold. And we ask for what are the top 10 factors that they choose, you know, this property. And uh, in the, of course, good old day, nobody talk about green features or, you know, even greening and landscape and all that. But increasingly, yes, green building, green environment, uh, landscape and all that are getting more and more important because people are more concerned about their health and well-being. And uh, even some uh, younger generation, they say, oh, I love the, the twin shoot pneumatic system, that the disposal system that segregate normal waste from recyclable waste. But I think from our own little humble experience, education is very important. Changing mindset is important. And that's why we engage young people. And uh, I, I share with you earlier on, we even send young people, young champion to the Arctic, to Antarctica, to Raja Ampat, to learn from the expert, to learn about 
challenges that pose from climate change and come back they youth can really associate with youth better and we even go to the library that we have uh, the world's first green library and um, uh, beach row it's called my tree house at uh, targeting at three years old to 12 years old we have a lot of books and uh, you know storytelling to cultivate them into our future champion. And it started in 2013, and now it's getting more and more popular. So I think we will have to be realistic in the first place, and we will also you know, be patient when you are talking about changing mindset. There are not many like you, the young champion. There are a lot of majority. They are still you know, denying, or they don't know much about climate change, or they know, but they say, never mind, you know, the melting of iceberg doesn't affect us, we are so far away, you know. So knowledge is power. So we need to do, whether public sector, private sector, we have to, you know, engage them and give them the knowledge. Once you engage them, awareness, then hopefully it will turn into action. Yeah. Can I add up? So I think on changing mindset, we shouldn't discount the power of storytelling. And that's why each individual, whether you're a government, company, what are your success stories and how are you, are you educating the public and incentivizing everyone to do something? So I'll, I'll start with a story. So the story starts in Chiang Rai, uh, a northern village called Pami in Thailand, where Four years ago, uh, so it's situated <coughs> on the border of Myanmar, Laos, and Thailand, the Golden Triangle, oh, okay. uh, and they uh, only knew about drug trafficking. So the youth and the villagers only knew about tr drug trafficking. But then uh, one of our travelers, a millennial, said um, to our group CEO, because um, he's so open on Twitter and on his social media that you can... Um, you can message him and he, she highlighted about this village and how they haven't been developed economically and sustainably. So he then sent one of us to look at that village and we started educating the villagers on sustainable tourism. We brought in experts to teach them how do you um, set a homestay, a sustainable homestay, how do you do waste management properly. Our cabin crew goes to the village uh, once a month to teach them English. So with that, from drug trafficking as an economic activity. Now, coffee trading is their main economic activity. And that's why we started from that one story, um, um, Air Asia's initiative called Journey D, Journey for Development, where we encourage our passengers to travel to more sustainable communities to highlight this. And I'm happy to say that UNDP has endorsed this. It meets 12 out of the 17 SDGs. Uh, four of the communities in Thailand, three of them are led by women. So check uh, SDG number five. And coming from the aviation sector where it's typically male dominated and um, also the central bank banking, um, we took the story of highlighting more our, of our female pilots. So we have one of the highest ratios of female pilots, one of our 20 uh, are female pilots and educating everybody that little girls anywhere, you can be a pilot, you can be a data scientist, you can be a cabin crew. Uh, and uh, that's really the, the genesis of one story that is very important to me, uh, where we uh, started this campaign called Hashtag Girls Can Do Anything. So if you Google that on, um, uh, on YouTube, you can see a powerful video that has really touched a lot of young girls to say that, ah, I can be a pilot too, or I can be a security guard, I can be a data scientist. So I think these stories, just to wrap it up, is something powerful to change mindsets, as Esther said, and to encourage partnership, which Isabel wants more. Oh, fantastic. Bradley. Um, thanks. Thank you. Um, a couple points. Um, the mic is working, yeah. Um, thanks. Just a couple points reflecting on all that's been said. So first is on... Um, Corporates and, and, and how that's the, the view of corporates changing towards sustainability. Um, if there's some great things happening um, at the climate change um, conference summit a, a couple months ago, um, asset managers have pledged two trillion dollars worth of assets will move towards um, carbon neutrality by 2050. A um, uh, hundred global companies have, have pledged to be carbon neutral. Um, that's all. That's all great, but. But who really stole the show at the, at, the, at the Climate Change Summit? It was an individual, it was an activist, right? So these things are all linked. Um, it, you know, I'm working more at the level of, sort of between governments and countries and things, but my view is 
clearly that it, 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 the real change, the real juggernaut, the real tipping point is going to come through activism and through young people and individuals too. Um, I think reflecting a lot of what people uh, around the table have, have said. I mean, because it, it, it's, it's astounding. I mean, um, a colleague from Twitter said you know, some of these stats of, of how um, the millennials and Generation Z are, are viewing things. Um, for the first time ever, I think, um, young people uh, are making massive decisions based on sustainability and environmental issues, right? uh, about what they eat, what they buy. Um, it's a defining... Um, factor in what jobs I'll have, you know, you know, you, do you want to work, I mean, they'd much prefer to work for companies like SAP or CDL or AirAsia than, than others. So that's, that's what's driving, right, the corporates and, and the governments to make these changes. So it, it is coming from that, that grassroots. Um, it's all connected, but, but that's what gives me hope. And, and having Isabel here speak about these things so passionately does give me hope. I'd just like to add there, I, I think that's really well said. In, in the, the studies, in the work that we've done with companies, it's no government legislation, it's no company that's gonna impact the change. It's generally gonna be defined by an individual within a company that drives an idea that they can build a legacy off of which creates a movement inside the organization. And the power of a movement inside of an organization can be really important to how that company perceives itself and how that company evolves, right? So if you look at organizations that have 10 plus years of experience, what they need to do and how they need to evolve is very different than an organization that's less than 10 years old. An organization that's 20 years old and 30 years old, they have to go through major metamorphosis. They have to have some individuals basically take up a mantle, a claim, a perspective that says, this is a movement I think is important to me. This is something that that I think will impact. And I love the comment earlier made about, is this a, uh, a world that, that we want um, people to, to inherit? And I think as, as people perceive that and take it in, the ultimate people that we have to target are the individuals in the organization with the courage and ability to say, you know what? This is how we need to move. This is how we procure with pur purpose or sell with purpose or market with purpose and put that into the vernacular so that it becomes simple, clear, and obvious to their internal stakeholders and equally to the external stakeholders. Those are the changes that we see happen and have a profound impact. Yeah. So uh, if I can just jump in here. So I, I do agree that it's, a lot of it is driven through individuals, right? And uh, as individuals, and I look at it not from the angle of, say, you know, what SP Digital can deliver to, to our customers, but also from what SP Digital is internally. So when I started this team, it was, I was pretty, pretty much alone, right? And uh, as I built out this team, I actually found a lot of uh, individuals, uh, software developers. I've been a software developer for 25 years, so I, I, I know about this. And uh, I found a lot of uh, developers, software engineers, who are actually very passionate about sustainability. And, I, and that's how I built my team, right? So I gathered uh, a lot of these people together, and we built products that will power sustainability. And that it really has been our, our sort of North Star um, towards the kind of products that we are building. Um, and that's why we are going out to the market and sell more of these products to enable our customers to do this. So when we're enabling customers, we're not just enabling customers from say, hey, you know, um, so now I know, what, what else do I do now? But it's really about, now I know, I know how much I use, how much I, I need to uh, save and how much I need to reduce. What do I do next? So we actually build technologies on top of it as well to ena enable this. So we, I mean, obviously as a software engineer, I'm not sure how many of you here are software engineers. So first thing you want to do is really build things to do stuff, right? Because you don't just want to build things that, that don't do anything. And we build IoT platform that actually reaches out to solar panels, to our energy storage systems, to control our charging stations and so on and so forth. And we control and we enable and we enable our consumers to actually do stuff. So I think, um, I think this is actually very inspiring, and I, I love uh, Isabel's uh, words on this because it gives me reason to believe that even the next generation of software developers um, are even more passionate, right? So, um, you know, in 10, 20 years' time when I, when I retire, then there are more developers who, software developers who are willing to come out and step up and actually build technology that would drive the changes in the world. 
Yeah, I think it's technology, it's, it's the social media, the storytelling. I think that's really going to really going to keep uh, propagating this forward. Um, I just wanted to, um, based on the audience questions, I just wanted to throw one out there. Given that we are in, <coughs> we are in the midst of the fintech festival, deep tech, uh, Singapore uh, Tech Week, what's the role that we feel? And anyone can take. Um, uh, take a shot at this. What's the role we feel that technology can play beyond what Sao Shong uh, described uh, from your perspective in terms of um, you know, addressing some of these issues and enabling businesses uh, to be more, uh, more efficient, be, you know, be able to move in that direction of being more sustainable? I'm going to start with a, a small suggestion. We've talked uh, quite a lot about uh, the, the sort of you know, shifting consumer preferences and, and so on. Um, and we've talked quite a lot about uh, corporations, so big companies that uh, um, have shareholder sort of feedback and, and so on. But in just about any economy, SMEs form the, the vast majority um, of uh, the, the business uh, interests that are there. So um, I think that uh, um, perhaps there, there is or should be a role for thinking about uh, technologies that can help SMEs better and more easily build uh, um, a broader sort of set of indicators um, into their business so they, they can um, more, more easily understand and, and uh, uh, operate in a way that is sustainable and that is in line uh, with climate goals. There, there's so much. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two, um, two points of view. As tech companies, uh, you know, a great way to start thinking about it is helping themselves and helping their customers and the broader ecosystem understand where are the largest portions of impact um, from their own contributing carbon footprint, for example. Right? When we looked at it as a company ourselves, we sort of th uh, said our data centers are probably the first place that we would start to think about uh, tackling uh, carbon footprint neutrality, right? And so there's a, there's a lot of work that we're kicking off to commit to getting ourselves to carbon neutral. But I thought the interesting approach as a tech company was to look at which is the largest chunk to be able to go tackle. But if you look at beyond the company and beyond the enterprise, I think that the world's woefully inadequate today on technologies to get us to beyond 4% contribution of of sustainable power. There's a lot of work to be done, whether you take um, plastics, right? There's, there's so much nascent technology, but not yet at scale, around ways to disrupt packaging, the, way, the ways to make sustainable materials for everyday use. Today, a consumer wants to do something other than use uh, plastic, single-use plastics. There should be good options for it. It should become available at scale and easily, um, and at a price competitive point. I actually think that we're only scratching the surface in technology companies, whether it is plastics, whether it is um, food security and agri-tech, there's so much work to be done here that I think even six years that Isabel's put into bye-bye plastic bags will shy compared to the number of years we'll need, I think, to get there. Yeah, if I could just jump in on that too. Um, so many ways, of course, um, you know, to help uh, technology as a platform like Twitter that gives us uh, all this data and um, information so that we can actually influence, um, shape decisions um, on sustainability for sure. Um, you mentioned about, you know, much more needs to be done in terms of, of plastics or plastic substitutes. A lot of cool work in that space is happening here in Singapore, but, but it's about, and, and also in Singapore in terms of uh, waste management, right? Uh, but how do you scale that? So I'm, we're you know, at the UN kind of really interested in sort of actually adding, a, unfortunately, another layer of complexity to this, like how do we do these things cheaply for the developing world, right? So that's why I mentioned in the beginning, how do we take this smart nation approach in Singapore and um, do it simpler, cheaper, faster um, for, you know, a media, like a middle tier city in Africa that will be a mega city in a few years, right? So. How do we do that sort of thing? It makes it harder, but that's the thing that we need to um, start looking at. Um, you mentioned um, food security, sustainable agriculture. We're, we're launching this global um, sus you know, sustainable digital agriculture initiative here. We urge corporates to um, 
reach out to us um, and startups and entrepreneurs that are into this space um, here uh, this week at FinTech and Switch to link up with us on this. It's, it's all about coming up with, uh, you know, cool, scalable, cheap solutions for, for the whole world in, in um, the digital agriculture space. Um, so lots of ways, but lots of untapped potential too, you're right. Um, <clears throat> since you're on the topic, Bradley, could we, um, do, do you think it might be worth sharing with everyone just the, the whole approach that the UN Task Force on Digital Finance is taking? Um. <laughs> sure. Um, that, um, so that, the Digital Task Force on, uh, the Task Force on Digital Finance is, I think started um, last year and um, it, it's actually remarkably foresight oriented for, for this big massive body of the United Nations uh, and has put together a lot of the key players in um, the digital finance world. Um, with some of the best thinkers from outside of that, uh, t thinking about um, what is the power of digital finance to disrupt for good um, uh, uh, the development trajectory of, 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 of countries, right? So what we're looking at is um, how we can kind of shape digital finance, shape fintech especially, so it's not just speaking this language of financial inclusion, which is really passive, but, but more sort of citizen-centric um, finance or it's not merely about sort of having people in the developing world have more access to their finance and know more about it, but, but make them look more active. And um, examples, um, how do we make sure smallholder farmers in Ghana, where I just was yesterday, uh, uh, can, can get better access to, to credit, can get that cheaper and faster? Um, so looking at things like how does digital finance um, reduce the cost of remittances, hugely important in the developing world. Hugely important phenomenon here in Singapore, people sending money back to, to their, um, their uh, countries. Um, and digital finance, FinTech has cut in half um, the cost of, uh, of remittances. It's, uh, that's, that's an important thing. Um, digital finance has like, shaved billions, hundreds of billions of dollars on, on uh, the cost of, of government payments, um, government costs around the world. So how does, all this stuff impacts the developing world so much more, right? Um, and so we're looking at all of this right now um, um, and trying to bring as many technologists and tech companies as possible into this discussion. Um, and and um, this week switch and FinTech week is a, a great time to, to do it. Our, our uh, chief digital officer from UNDP, from New York, is um, here uh, with us to, to, to work on these things over the next couple of days. So hope we'll meet as many of you as possible. I think one thing to add there is um, for, for large organizations, I mean, I work at a very large technology company. It's 98,000 people. Um, but but, but the, the question, I think, ultimately becomes how, how does an organization take responsibility? So specifically speaking uh, to SAP, we operate this, this, this large network. It's basically a trading hub between buyers and sellers. We, we trade $3.1 trillion per year on that network. Next year, it'll hit $5.5 trillion. About a year and a half ago, our president said, we have a responsibility. When you look at that trade, a high percentage of the trade is going to be with SMEs. And a high percentage of that trade is centered on large organizations that buy a lot of stuff. And we help them buy that stuff. So the question on responsibility be became, what kind of information do we share? How do we facilitate that digital payment so that the supplier can be paid faster? Or how do we share risk information or anti-modern slavery information with companies? And I think those are the steps that big companies, sometimes they don't know it's happening, have to start thinking through and say, gosh, we have an impact on, on the globe or we have an impact on people. Um, and we should figure out how to share that. And we should figure out how to explain that to people and see what we can do with it. And I think that's kind of the moment we're in as a company. It's a 40 year old company. It's hard to reform sometimes, but this is one of those areas where we say we have a responsibility to help people get paid sooner and ultimately understand their supply. Yeah, uh, look, <coughs> and that's a really good point. I'm just going to one of the questions here. Uh, and it's about 
should this be limited to major banks and corporates? And obviously, to your point, Joe, earlier, we've, we've got a view of policymakers, governments, and um, you know, the corporates that are represented here are fortunate to have leaders like yourselves to make that difference, right? But when it comes to, comes, you know, when we start to talk about SMEs and businesses, um, mid-sized businesses, even if there is appetite, they have to be conscious of their economic goals, right? So is there a role that um, government needs to play or um, <coughs> collectives that need to play that would actually incentivize, is there a way to incentivize businesses to, um, uh, to work more towards um, these sustainable goals, even if there is an opportunity cost um, along the way, because often there is. So how do they overcome that hurdle and, and keep moving in that direction? What's the sort of incentives that can be put in place? Maybe I'll take that question first and, and, and Her Excellency could add on later on. In, in Singapore, we, we say that some of the things that you can do for a business uh, in order to be more sustainable um, don't necessarily have to cost you so much. In fact, it could actually be beneficial to the business. So for example, you, you pay upfront but you can recover the cost over time because uh, you put in place something that's more energy efficient and a, and a, and a sort of equipment or a process. Um, and so the CAPEX, saving, uh, the CAPEX expenditure basically gets offset um, by the savings in electricity bills um, over the life cycle of, of uh, the equipment. And so what we do is we provide um, grants and we've actually just provided more energy efficient grants uh, to the industry um, so that they can actually put in place such energy saving equipment and we provide support um, up to 50% of, of, of um, the expenditure that they would have to, 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 to uh, pay out. Um, and we do this as well even in the building sector. So there are various um, incentives as well uh, for, for building owners to actually go more green. Beyond grants, um, what we've actually been working on as well is really putting in place the R&D expenditure as well as the ecosystem for companies to be able to test bid the solutions using Singapore as a living lab so that they can find solutions which actually work and then scale up these solutions and export them overseas. Um, well, <laughs> in New Zealand's case, uh, we introduced essentially put a price on carbon. Um, and we did that back in, in 2008. Um, and uh, that um, is intended to act as an incentive for um, uh, business, for the private sector, uh, to um, reduce its emissions, um, dependent, of course, on, on what that carbon price uh, looks like. Um, I think the um, other areas we are looking into now um, include setting government targets um, and working with the, the, um, the private sector to uh, change behaviour. Um, we tend not to be uh, either a heavy regulator nor um, a government that provides grants or, or subsidies. Uh, so it is more about working with um, uh, the sector to, or different sectors, uh, to change behaviour and influence behaviour. Um, I'm just trying to, to um, think of what quick e examples might be, but one, uh, I guess, is in uh, the transport area, um, looking to nudge uh, and encourage uh, a shift to uh, electric vehicles and recognising that a big chunk uh, or a, a big difference can be made by focusing on fleets, whatever the size of the fleets, um, and if that shift can be made, then, then there is a, um, a trickle down to, to the rest of, of the country. So very much looking at, um, at supporting, uh, um, you know, making it cost competitive uh, in upfront terms uh, for electric vehicles, looking at charging infrastructure and so on to, to make it easier uh, to make the shift there. Well, thank you for that. Um, I just, just one last question if someone wants to have a crack at it. Um, it says here, so one, one of the, uh, someone from the audience said, one of the public, uh, many of the public are aware of the climate situation, but remain disengaged. Uh, how can we engage and motivate them to take action? And I thought this would be a nice question to close on. Um, so if anyone wants to have a crack at that one. 
Um, I guess I can start. I know with Bye Bye Plastic Bags, a lot of the ways that we engage people and engage the whole island of Bali to be involved and on board with the plastics issue was through education, like Esther said, right? And because we think that so much because if you're raised from a young age, knowing not to litter, don't burn plastic bags, turn off the lights when you leave, all these small, but you know, if they add up, they are quite big changes in your lifestyle. It <coughs> can lead you to change your entire lifestyle. Um, I believe that change happens in the classroom, right? Because if you're taught from a young age, knowing that, you're gonna do that. That's what you're gonna raise your children doing. That's what you're gonna go home. That's what you're gonna tell your friends. And so we're a big believer that education is the key to change. If people don't know about problems, you can't expect them to come up with the solutions. And so that's why with Youthtopia, our following our next project that we've launched focuses so much on young people because we believe the potential they have. Whether that's in the environmental and plastic sector, whether that's in fintech, we want to encompass the SDG goals to really create a headquarter for young people to come together, whether they're change makers, aspiring change makers, um, to learn the tools to go back into the communities and make that difference through education. I don't know if anybody else wanted to say anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to add on to uh, what you just said. It's about education, about keeping people informed and letting them know. So uh, there's a bit of a sale on the SP Utility apps again, but uh, we actually enabled this uh, function. Previously, you can only see your utility usage if you are the account owner, and usually this is the head of the family. So there's only maybe the father, like for, for example myself. I, I, I'm the only person in the home who knows it in the past. But we actually enable family and friends now so say my children, um, my, my son and my wife now can actually monitor it as well. I can even associate them to say, look, this is how much you're actually using it. And I know uh, driving it further down the road, there's actually more um, initiative to drive down to the individual, say the uh, socket level, uh, the information that is actually uh, 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 captured at the socket level to know how much electricity has been used by per socket, right? So I think a lot of these things drive down to change. And we're working with the, uh, different parties as well to actually do things like the smart DB, the smart distribution box, where you can actually know information at a circuit level uh, in terms of consumption. All of this drives information, and uh, providing this information to the consumers gives them the power to make the change. Fantastic. Now, look, thank you. Um, <coughs> ending on a good note there, Saoshong. I want to thank everyone. Um, all the change makers have taken the time uh, to be here and inspire us. And hopefully we'll all have something to take away. Um, big round of applause for, uh, for all the folks on the stage here. Right. Thank you.